This video is about Relight Ray Tracer, which is a new render engine available in Bakery Relight 2. You will need to understand here several concepts explained in first basic tutorial, so if you didn't follow it yet, we recommend that you do it first. Now let's load the lighting layout from a new window, layout presets, and let's open the baker scene from a new file, example scenes, baker. Now first thing to do is to go in the render options here and in the page rendering and take a look at this attribute called hider. Hider determines which render engine is used for primary rays. So by default in Relight it is set to Rayes, which is the common algorithm used by renderman renderers. But now we can change this and use ray tracing instead. So let's render the scene with a ray tracer engine and let's see what it changes. So we can see that rendering is the same as in first tutorial. Let's uncheck the pin button so that we have automatic refresh. And again, we can pick on the image to select any node from the scene. We can tweak attribute values and see instantaneous refresh without limitation on the attributes that we can change. We can select a node and do view selected shader or use the shortcut H to view the contribution of this node on the final rendering. And we have all these nice features which are still supported even in ray tracing. And all this happening thanks to the caching that is enabled here. But something to know about caching is that it relies on how geometries are seen on screen. So it's very useful when you spend some time from the same point of view tweaking your shaders and lights, which is what usually happens in production. But if you want to spend your time moving the camera all around the scene, then having the caching enabled is not a good option. So since that's what we want to do here, we're going to disable the caching. So now each time we render, it's going to take the same time. So since it can be long, we're going to menu render and enable progressive refinement, which is only available when ray tracer hider is used. This is not supported in rays. So now we can see that when we render, we have the result being refreshed progressively. Now let's move the camera. We could do it from the 3D view, but here I'm actually going to close the 3D view and I will do everything directly from the render view. Because by default, when you manipulate your image in the render view using the Alt key, you move it in 2D. But if you switch to view 3D manipulation, then you start manipulating the camera in 3D as if you were using the 3D view. So now you can move all around the scene and see the rendering being refreshed progressively. So it can be very interesting to see the rendering from different point of views and to have a very quick feedback on what you're doing. Like for example, if I change the light intensity, I have an almost immediate idea of what I'm changing. I don't have to wait until the rendering is finished. So this is why this kind of technology can be very interesting in production. And this is why it is so widely used in several existing renders. So now Bakery Light 2 supports that feature. Unfortunately, you may know that when you work only with this kind of technology, it can sometimes be limited because you will often need detail on what you're doing. And with big production scenes, it usually can take a while before the refresh is detailed enough. Like for example, if I change a specular, I can't really see what I'm doing immediately. I have to wait until the refinement is detailed before I have a real feedback. And that happens quite often in practice. So with big scenes, if you want interactivity, you can end up working on low resolution images only, which is not always a good idea. So this is where it can be very interesting to combine this progressive refinement with Relight's caching technology. So after you have moved all around the scene, whenever you find a good point of view and you know that you want to spend some time there tweaking your shaders and lights, then you simply enable the caching. And now you'll have an interactive feedback on your changes. You don't even need any progressive refinement because it's much faster here. And thanks to the caching, the more you'll work, the faster it's going to render. For example, here I changed the key light color. Now I'm changing the fill light color too. And let's say that I'm happy with these changes. Then now I simply remove the caching and I start moving again to see how it behaves from other point of views. And you can uh, repeat that as often as necessary. So as you can see, you have best of both worlds in the same workflow, which is really unique. And you can choose what technology to use depending on your situation. And you can still use the different shading modes available in Relight. So for example, you can select any node and use the shortcut H to view the selected node's contribution in the final rendering. So here I'm inspecting a material from different angles. Now I'm also inspecting a bump texture, so I can zoom in to make sure that it's projected correctly. I can do the same with the light and move around and see how it behaves and check m that my shadows are fine, for example. I can use the menu shading diffuse albedo or use the shortcut D. So this is showing me the color of the nodes. So it can be useful to 
to check that the textures are fine. I can also use the basic shading mode with shortcut B. So basic shading simply skips the material evaluations, which is usually the longest part of the rendering. So it's very fast and you just see the geometries. So it can even be useful to move your camera or make sure that geometries are, are fine. So you still have all these shading modes uh, with or without caching. Okay, now let's talk about anti-aliasing settings. Usually in a ray tracer you have an attribute that controls the amount of rays per pixel. And here in the render options this attribute is the pixel sampling. It is set to 3, so we have 3 squared, so 9 samples per pixel. But we also have this other attribute here, the shading rate. And RenderMan users know this parameter, it's often called tessellation rate, and it controls the size of micro polygons. So you may be wondering what this attribute is doing here in ray tracing. Actually, Relight can do micro polygon ray tracing. This technique allows to have in a ray tracer several of the benefits usually reserved to RenderMan users. So at render time, the polygons are subdivided into very small micro polygons, and the shaders are only evaluated once per micro polygon. So here, since the shading rate is set to 1, I have roughly 1 micro polygon per pixel. And having these two separate controls can be very useful because it simply means that you can increase your anti-aliasing a lot without exploding your rendering time, which is the problem that you usually have with simple ray tracers. So if you have fur, or detailed geometries, or 3D motion blur, or depth of field, you know that you have to increase your anti-aliasing. But here, all the costly evaluations, so the materials, lights, shadows, possibly global illumination, ambient occlusion, glossy reflection, all this will only be computed once per pixel here, so it will still, still be fast. So for example, if I set the shading rate to a big value like 10, my anti-aliasing doesn't change, but my shading gets blurry because my micro polygons are bigger, and it's faster, of course. On the other hand, let's come back to a shading rate of 1. If I set the pixel sampling to 1, my shading doesn't change, but I get aliasing issues at the edges because I have only one ray per pixel. Now let's see an example, I, let's enable motion blur. And here my camera is parented to a turntable animation, so the motion blur will show like a rotation movement. And let's exaggerate this movement by setting the blur length to 4. So now I have this huge motion and I have a lot of grain, which is normal since I only have one ray per pixel. But now if I increase the pixel sampling to 5, I'm having 25 rays per pixel, which is enough here. But my rendering times are still fast. And you can see I can get a smooth motion blur without grain, which can be hard to get with the usual ray tracers. And you can also notice that here my motion blur is perfectly circular, which is one of the advantages of our ray tracer versus Reyes hider. Because in Reyes we would see a linear motion here, but in ray tracing we have a perfectly circular motion. We, we don't even need multi-segment motion blur. Okay, now let's remove the motion blur and let's zoom on this French baguette. So by inspecting the geometry, we can see that it needs some smoothing here. So the usual way to arrange that is to change the smooth level. So you can do that by right-clicking on subdiv presets, and then you have a list of different values for different situations like uh, OpenGL or ray tracing or point clouds. And this cell here is for ray tracing, so it's set to 1, and we can increase that value. But another way to arrange that is to change the tessellation mode here from fixed to micro polygons. And now the, the subdivision surface is going to be evaluated for each micro polygon. So we have a fully smooth surface. We don't even need a smooth level, it's just perfectly smooth. So that's one of the, of the advantages of uh, having micro polygons. Another one is displacement. So now let's focus on the character's hat. We can see that it has some bump and we want to replace it by displacement. So uh, let's first select a region. We can either right click and choose region selection or if we don't want to change the selection mode we can simply press space and then drag the mouse to select the region we want. Now we don't need the shaders so we simply display the basic shading using shortcut B. Okay. Now let's switch the shading tree from material graph to full graph so we can see everything connected to the geometry node. And we can right click and create a displacement node. Now we remove the connection 
from the bump texture to the bump attribute of the material and we connect it to the displacement. And now we connect the displacement to the tessellator and now we can see the displacement in the render view. So it's really huge, you need to decrease the amplitude of displacement. So we can use the slider here and change the, the amount of displacement using the attribute scale. Let's say the uh, value of minus 0 0.1 is OK. And now if we zoom in here, we can see that we have a lot of detail because we're doing micro polygon displacement here. So we have all this huge amount of detail in this image and it's not costly. So now let's do the same on the apron. So we select the hat, now we press Control and select the apron from the render view. So we have both nodes selected and we also connect the displacement to the apron geometry. Okay, so now we have the displacement apply applied to both with same intensity. We can remove the, the region by pressing space and clicking outside. Okay. So now we have our rendering done. Uh, we had this micro polygon displacement. We had a perfectly smooth subdivision surface. And we could decorrelate the anti-aliasing from the shading rate. So all these advantages that you usually have with ray as rendering, now you can have them in ray tracing too. Well, you may have noticed that I didn't speak about indirect illumination here. And maybe you think that when you use the ray tracing mode, you, you have to do everything in ray tracing. But it's not the case, actually. You can do it if you want, but you don't have to. You can still use all these options that have been shown in the first basic tutorial. You can use point clouds for global illumination or ambient occlusion, or you can switch to ray tracing. You can use shadow maps, like in the scene by default, or you can switch to ray tracing or you can even use point clouds for soft area lights. Actually, we provide you all these technologies and instead of choosing for you which one is the best, we let you decide the one you want to use depending on your situation. So today in most situations, the ray as hider remains faster to render than the ray tracing, but the ray tracing has the advantage of supporting progressive refinement. So it's up to you to choose which one you prefer depending on the situation. And you can even switch from one to another by just changing this attribute hider in the render options. You don't have anything else to change. So you really have both workflows in same application. And there exist a few situations where ray tracing can still be much faster than ray is. And a typical example is instancing because having millions of instances is something that doesn't scare any ray tracer because it's very easy to handle. But a renderman renderer will require to have level of detail or the scene may even be impossible to render. You can find an example here in my new file, example scenes, lion's crowd. So in this scene, what we had as an input was a simple lion mesh. Then in real light, we have created procedurally some fur over this mesh. So some short fur for the whole body and then some long hair for the lion's mane. You will find a tutorial about hair styling in real light in the release. So here a lion has around 400,000 hair strands. Then we created a huge plane and we made instances of this lion. So all this was done procedurally in real light. And we also added some grass using fur so this scene has around two billion and a half hair strands and as you can see it's rendering quite quickly here in my dual quad core it's around a minute in 1k and without any level of detail so here the hider has already been set to ray tracer because in rays this would be much longer to render and you would surely require some level of detail so whenever you have such scenes or uh, like forest or lots of instances, then uh, using ray tracing can be a good choice. So since you just have to change the hider to test it, it can be a good choice and it's useful to have both options in same application.